Uh, great. Okay, so I think we're ready for uh, our, our, our next and, and last lecture. So it's my, you know, great honor to introduce our keynote uh, lecturer for this uh, uh, laminar for my course, Peter Benettini. I think, can't think of a better person to uh, wrap up uh, this, this course. And so thanks, Peter, for being here. And so I think many of you, I don't think Peter needs an introduction, but I'll just say a couple of words. Uh, so I think many of you know that Peter's contributed enormously uh, to the field of laminar fMRI. I think I can't think of a better person to address this sort of ambitious uh, title that we provided about can laminar fMRI change human neuroscience. But I'll also mention to you that, um, as I mentioned yesterday, Peter has been contributing a lot to our field in general. He was the editor in chief at uh, NeuroImage for many years, also I think now editor in chief at uh, Aperture as well. Uh, so Peter's been involved, you know, enormously in the Organization for Human Brain Mapping and the ISMRM. And I think many of you know that Peter actually contributed the first you know, fMRI, human fMRI study uh, back in, in, in 1992. And so Peter's been involved in the field. Also, I think that uh, Robert Savoy mentioned <laughs> during his opening lecture that, um, that Robert and Peter have been teaching uh, fMRI for, you know, almost, uh, gosh, 30 years now. And I think that, uh, <laughs> I, think that uh, I think no one has as much experience teaching this topic uh, as Peter. And so we're really happy to have him here and uh, and welcome back to the Martino Center. Also, Peter uh, was a uh, postdoc at the Martino Center uh, uh, in, in the um, 1990, 95, 96. And so we're actually able to visit uh, the location of his uh, desk as a postdoc <laughs> uh, last night. And so Peter, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, welcome, thank you so much. This this is a little bit easier. I think we're our friends over Zoom. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Great. This advances. Uh, yeah. The hours of music. Yes. Okay. It's not. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, very much. Thanks, John. Thanks for everyone, the organizers, for inviting me uh, to this. This is really an honor. Um, yeah. This very room I've been uh, teaching in. Yeah. This you know the fMRI course has been going on for yeah twenty five years or maybe thirty. Um, uh, yeah, it's always nice to come back here to, to MGH because, uh, yeah, I did do my postdoc here and, and it's just wandering the halls. Things have kind of changed a lot. I mean, my desk is now like somewhere, you know, near the, the, the seven Tesla scanner and whatever, and it's gone, long gone. Um, uh, and, and so it's really nice because you feel the energy here and it's just not doing done nothing but grow. Um, and, and so as with that, you can feel the energy with the work with Laminar F9, and like anything that sort of pushes the technology and the understanding, uh, it forces you to sort of get better at both the technology and in interpreting the signal. And so, you know, going to seven Tesla makes uh, all the people developing scanners better physicists, going to Laminar fMRI makes all of us better uh, uh, fMRI scientists. So, um, and also this title was given to me and I usually sort of change the title and I was thinking of changing it. I thought, no, I can work with this. This is good. This is, uh, and, I'll, and I'll try my best to uh, um, uh, try to honor that sort of title to see what, and put myself out there to sort of suggest what might be the impact and how it will impact it. So the first of all, the, the answer, I won't, I won't delay the answer. Of course, it's gonna change uh, neuroscience. <laughs> um, it, it already has. Uh, and the, the, you know, the, the question actually sort of comes down to, you know, how exactly will it change it? Uh, how has it been changing it? Uh, what are the avenues? Uh, what's needed? Uh, what's actually needed to change it more and better um, that, we, that we probably could do? Uh, what's uncertain? Uh, there, there's certainly a lot of uncertainties about this. And uh, what's hopeful? So, um, you know, the way I, I started thinking about, okay, so neuroscience research is you know, this, this process and, and it's very broad and I'm not going to try to get my head around it completely here, but, you know, we build models of, of you know, the brain on many different levels, uh, computational models, we build, um, you know, vascular models, we build, uh, you know, that's basically what drives our hypotheses. And uh, then we have our tools. And, you know, some sort of combination of models and tools. tools. Tools allow us a parameter space in which to explore. And and then we get data and we fill out the models. That's sort of the ideal thing. And then there's some times where uh, we don't really have a well thought out model. We just have a tool and a lot, a lot of us are tool makers. And we're like, we just want to see what the tool can do. And so we have a rough model about 
what the tool is sensitive to, and then we just do it. You know, so much of my research has just been, you know, that sort of thing where I sort of have a rough idea and I'm sort of exploring and you, you learn the art of kind of exploring well, uh, sort of looking at your data carefully and sort of getting a sense of like, oh, is this something interesting or not? And so it's not a formal model, but it's always important to sort of work towards the formal model because that's where the real ratchets in science are, where you have a model that's either true or false. Um, and then you can ratchet forward with that. And so there's, they each have a place. There's exploration and there's the experimentation part with the modeling and the hypothesis driven stuff. Uh, and so I'll talk about, um, you know, we're sort of at this stage now where we're kind of exploring the capability of this tool. We're trying to understand it better. Um, so there's many, uh, you know, also as I've been thinking about neuroscience, you know, there's many temporal and spatial scales uh, by which the brain is organized, obviously. Um, you know, this is a, a nice diagram, I think, from Patricia Churchland uh, a long time ago. It's been redone. It's really sort of gives you a sense that there is a lot, a lot of complexity and detail across, you know, everything from the brain down to uh, molecules. And, and it's all, uh, in, you know, we feel, you know, they all talk to each other. The scales are continuous. Uh, the question they often have is like, you know, what, what model, what, what, uh, uh, level of detail, what scale is the most relevant to understanding like princ principles of brain function. And, uh, you know, people try to do network models and they try to extract that to, for building AI and they think, okay, well, the principles are at this network level, you know, uh, uh, on some level, which might be true, or is the principle somehow, you know, grounded in the action potential? Is that somehow determine everything? Is it, is, is, where's the, where's the meat in terms of really understanding how the brain actually works. I mean, the, the, the salient uh, uh, scale. It's obviously all important, um, but that's sort of something I think about. And fMRI sort of hits at sort of like the, you know, the map down to almost the circuit level. And of course, there's many time scales too uh, for understanding the brain. It changes instantaneously and it changes up to, you know, it's constantly changing over the years. So, and it's all interesting and it's all um, uh, open for trying to understand, you know, there's hormonal changes, there's activation changes. Um, so, so, you know, we're trying to use layer fMRI to sort of take a stab at the temporal and spatial scale that we think is relevant. All right. So, uh, layer fMRI, you know, uh, is sort of a result of the fact that MRI has sort of improved in, uh, its capability of looking at uh, high resolution, uh, by a factor of 10 every decade. Um, maybe it's a little bit less than a factor of 10 because this, this first one was sort of artificially. Uh, low resolution just because we could only collect one slice and so we just hedged our bets and collected a really thick slice. Um, but aside from that, it's pretty impressive, uh, the progress are going and every single time we think, oh, we're just, it's not going to go any further, it goes a little further. Uh, people either develop rating coils or acquisition strategies uh, to go further. Um, and uh, just to put this in further perspective, um, you know, this, and this is uh, a, a nice summary slide that's been sort of re redone by uh, Camille Uludag and sort of saying that, okay, so we're looking at um, human imaging and, uh, you know, this is sort of the niche uh, that we can look at human imaging. And this is going up to, there's a difference between looking at blobs, you know, a long time ago versus uh, looking at layers where you can start to see detail. And looking at human imaging, you know, there's this area, uh, this temporal and spatial uh, niche that we that we hope are you know pieces of meaningful information. And then there's evidence that you know some people even think uh, that it's the level of the column. Uh, you know the brain is potentially divided into these functional units of columns. That that it's sort of a mesocircuit. It's not a microcircuit, and that that where the in, the the information is actually handled. Uh, so that's the one that you know may, might you know define everything that we do or most everything. So that's a good thing. That would be awesome if, if we could actually hit that resolution and uh, and go with it. Renzo already showed this. Actually, a lot of these slides are you've already seen. I just have my own take on them. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this, all the demographics and the and the timings and the and the the fact that that uh, there's certain journals that favor it. There's, it's no it's no mystery why, uh, for instance, neuroimage and now imaging neuroscience, uh, you know, favor layer fMRI because. The most important work right now, I really do think, is in the in the methods, in the development, in, in validation of the technique. And pretty much it's it's pretty much all validation. Even the ones that are applications, if they're really well-crafted neuroscience experiments, 
that have an interesting application. That's sort of a validation. Uh, you, you can tie it into the rest of neuroscience literature and uh, it's, it, it sort of helps boost up the technique. But I really think that uh, the validation work is, is fundamental. Um, and I always, always watch these trends. I mean, certainly you're, you're hoping you know, this is very sharp and it just takes off. And it's very much a function of, of uh, availability of seven Tesla scanners. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my concerns, but one thing outside of this is I'm a little bit concerned that, that uh, you know, seven Tesla, uh, we have a very interesting synergistic relationship with, with uh, vendors and clinical applications. And, uh, and that's what helped three Tesla become available because it was in clinically incredibly useful. So it propagated and so everyone now can image that three Tesla, but with seven Tesla, it's still sort of like a, you know, like a Formula One racing car where it's sort of a, it's not a publicly consumable uh, product yet. And it's, so there's only about hundred in the world or so, 120. And, you know, Siemens is a company and they're very much bottom line. They're like, at some point they're going to say, well, this isn't sustainable. <laughs> and so I think one of our goals, even though we care about using seven Tesla is to uh, try our best to uh, make seven Tesla clinically applicable. Uh, so that it, it catches on as far as a, as a product. <laughs> um, our research sort of depends on that. Uh, so anyway, so how will it make an impact? How will fMRI make, uh, how will layer fMRI make an impact? Well, the, the, the first thing, which is, which is really clear, is that it's, you know, with human research. There's no other, uh, there's no other technique that, well, maybe, uh, you know, some, uh, some on the horizon, but there's, there's no other technique that gets at the resolution we can get at uh, in humans, non-invasively, longitudinally, uh, uh, that exists. So, and fundamentally, uh, neuroscience research sort of, you know, is motivated by understanding ourselves. So, uh, so that's uh, certainly a huge advantage that will always be there. That's that's uh, a really strong lever. Um, another key advantage. I mean, all these things are kind of obvious, but I just want to make them clear that. That's a big thing. Another thing is simply uh, so much of neuroscience research is, you know, with, you know, single electrodes and very probing one specific area where very, very well. Uh, the key advantage of, of uh, uh, layer fMRI uh, is that you can do whole brain uh, coverage pretty, uh, not easily, but you can do it. And, and the information, I mean, uh, you know, what we're doing is all about I mean, what we really want to understand is how things communicate and how things are connected in isolation. It's, it's missing a lot of its relevance. And so we're trying to understand how the brain is connected. And so that, that we can do that is, is a hugely powerful thing. And so that's, those are two other levers. Other things are, of course, uh, you know, how it will make an impact is the synergy it has with the animal model experiments. We, you know, looking for, you know, both motivating, the animal experiments. So like that's, for instance, um, a, a lot of studies actually, you, you do a study, you see activation, a place where an electrophysiologist was looking, but then you see somewhere else, the electrophysiologist might then decide to put their probes there. Uh, and that's really useful. Um, and it can go both ways. Uh, in electrophysiology, you see an interesting uh, effect. Uh, you can decide to look at the connectivity of that effect with every other place with, uh, with fMRI. And then also, um, uh, and of course, the, the fourth area is, is sort of building out mechanistic models of brain function that span spatial and temporal scales. So, uh, so this will allow you to sort of take those, all the data from electrophysiology and all the data from uh, calcium imaging and, and things like that. And then sort of, you know, that in itself is useful, but sort of trying to build out the whole model of how those areas are connected to other areas and, uh, you know, make the model multi-scale of how the brain is organized. So I, I'd like to, I have an analogy. Um, I just thought I'd bring this up. Just it's it's uh, sort of interesting. Um, a little bit of history. Uh, I, this came from a. Uh, I was talking on a completely different topic uh, uh, with uh, uh, Fernando Ramirez, who was in my in my group, and he, he he gave me these slides. Basically, this is what Saturn looked like to when Galileo was testing out his his telescope. You know, it looked like this, and. Uh, he drew it and he's like, oh, it, you know, what, what's going on here? There's, uh, you know, there's three planets here. There's Saturn and two other planets. And, uh, and that were, that's what the data were. And, and then, um, uh, so that was in 1610. And then this is, you know, 1659. Uh, there was this person, Christian Huggins, who 
you know, had a compelling model to say that, oh, it's actually rings causing this sort of thing. This is the effect, and this is how the planet has to be relative to the sun and the earth uh, to, to actually see this. But it wasn't, there was no data to really verify this. And finally, finally along came uh, 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 Hook, who, who basically um, uh, observed uh, here that uh, in, 19, in 1666, with this a little bit better uh, telescope, the rings of Saturn. And, and obviously today in Hubble, we, with Hubble and, and, uh, and the Webb telescopes, we get not only the detail, but we get other information, you know, uh, spectroscopic information, all kinds of things that we would never see otherwise. And so the, the analogy I have, I mean, it's very simple, but it's, it's sort of useful as a perspective builder. It's like as if we were having telescopes all along that could actually, like laser telescopes that can penetrate into certain parts of Saturn and see all of this great detail. And, but not really, you know, know that's even a planet or even, you know, how these, these details relate in any sort of way. And, and then you had standard fMRI that came along and it's, that shows this, that kind of helps a little bit, but doesn't, you know, it helps a little bit. I mean, you have areas that you can see that could be, but then this is the way I like to think of, of laminar fMRI. So laminar fMRI is sort of like a, you know, it, it tells you that there's rings there. It gives you information that you don't have to guess about. And it sort of can then start to work a little bit more closely with, with the neuroscience research to then, you know, build out this model of, of the brain that you, that you couldn't get with anyone by themselves. So that's where I like to think of it. It's very complementary. So, and just one example, and you've seen this before of, of, of building things out in some sense. And so you have, uh, this is some really nice work by, uh, by, by Renzo. Most of these slides, a lot of these slides are, are from, from, from Renzo. Um, uh, you know, I have to give him credit for, uh, you know, being one of the people, one of the main people sort of just pushing this field and with his energy and rigor. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, John and everyone else. Uh, but, uh, but so this work is, is basically showing uh, just a simple example of a very simple experiment, taking a seed voxel and seeing the areas that it's correlated with. And of course, we've done this many, many times in the context of, of low resolution fMRI. And the basic model is that you have uh, input uh, into the upper layers uh, that comes from either you know, sensory or, or thalamic input, and then you have uh, then output. Uh, and I just learned today, and I just actually, or yesterday, uh, the idea that, that what we're looking at when we see uh, uh, other layer activity is related to input. And so we're not actually seeing the neural activity related to the output. We're seeing the input from the upper layers to that area to cause output, I think. So that, that was kind of cool. But anyway, the, just a purely empirical experiment, sort of not model driven. Just let's see what, we, what happens. We take a seed right here in the upper layer. And you can actually see that if you take a seed in the upper layer of motor cortex, you have all this sensory area that seems to show a correlation, which is which is really interesting. And then you take a seed um, uh, in the upper layers, I'm sorry, the lower layers or uh, right here, and you find that uh, it's the, the correlation structure with the brain is extremely different. So to me, this is a very simple experiment. It's kind of exploratory, but it's, it's brand new information, completely new information that we, that we never had just by averaging large seeds or taking parcels or things like that. Um, and it's information that we kind of know from neuroscience, but once again, it's sort of like, it, it sort of motivates the neuroscience to then go and further test this. And you can imagine doing this throughout the entire brain and exploring this. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and of course you can switch this around and invert the, the question of, of then looking at a layer, looking at the layer in motor cortex, and adjusting uh, where your seed is, either in pre, you know, premotor areas, a big seed in premotor areas, or or in sensory areas. And if you do that, you actually see, as uh, the model seems to suggest. And this is also, once again, this is a model that's super simplified. But it, but it, one thing that I've found with layer fMRI is that even though you have these simple models. Um, if the data are good quality and and you and you're able to probe it well, it seems like it sort of falls in with these models to some degree. And so I I'm sort of kind of shocked by that because I was you know it's almost working better than I expected to work. Uh, so that's really hopeful. So basically, you find that uh, when you take a seed in the premotor, it it uh, 
upper layers show a, a selective uh, correlation. And when you take a seed in a sensory, uh, somatosensory areas, um, uh, or you, you have this double peak that, that kind of shows uh, uh, feedback. All right, and, and this, I won't dwell on this, uh, this slide that much more other than saying that you can actually, so once again, this is doing something profoundly different than, than any you know, single probe in any one area could do. Uh, at least it's doing it more efficiently. Uh, and that's sort of immediately asking the question is uh, of how this area is connected, just looking at resting state correlations. Uh, how this very, very small area at a layer level, and even though there are hemodynamic issues potentially and other problems, uh, this is actually uh, uh, making that impact. Uh, so, and also this is, uh, you know, a, an example, I'll just go over it one more time that, um, so you have this hierarchy of, of organization between MT, which is higher than V1 and LGN, which feeds into V1. And basically uh, what Renzo did here was just take a seed in V1, uh, uh, looking at one layer and uh, looking at, um, I'm sorry, looking at the signal in V1, but then taking seeds in either LGN, uh, and then you show in that same area, uh, this sort of input sort of signature. And uh, uh, then you, you can look at, uh, at a seed in MT, and you see that same area that you're looking, uh, this, this uh, double hump sort of signature of, of feedback. So it's the same area, same noise, same signal, uh, but using a different reference function, you're pulling out different information based on the connectivity. Uh, so, it, which I think is, is just uh, um, something that, that should be done more. <laughs> um, and here's just an example of how, not only between MT and, not, and, and, and LGN, but if you just go along the cortical ribbon, you can actually see uh, the, the, you can clearly see that hump changing from one hump to two humps, depending on where you're picking your seed. So that, that's a powerful technique. And of course, uh, along the lines of the power of it being whole brain, we want to do whole brain. And this is where things get a little bit more difficult. I mean, certainly uh, uh, Renzo and others have developed techniques for doing whole brain imaging. You give up, because with vaso, you have to wait for a certain amount of time for the signal, the inverted signal to go through the null point. Um, it has a very inefficient time efficiency. It's, you know, some long TR, but uh, you can shorten that with some sacrifice and contrast. It's still a T1 contrast, but you, you, it's, you know, it, uh, it's doable. Uh, Yuhui Chai uh, developing a technique called vapor um, in which uh, uh, it combines perfusion and what's called like a Dante pulse that sort of tags blood moving in. Uh, it's sensitive to both blood volume and, and perfusion, and it's a little bit more time efficient than vaso. So I'm still, you know, waiting for the definitive. I mean, this is what we need more of in the field to make it have an impact is really definitive comparisons between these pulse sequences. So along the lines of the discussion yesterday on you know, what gets published, if you just publish a paper and saying, oh, this, this work is great, um, it's, it's much, much more helpful if you say, oh, this work is great, and here's a, a comparison with the next greatest thing in detail, and this is what the field may, you know, can then decide on what's, what's better. So it's good to have new techniques, but it's good also to compare. And, and make rigorous, very, very rigorous comparisons that seem boring, but they're really important. Um, all right, and so, and this is an example of uh, whole brain work. Uh, and this was work by Emily Finn when, when collaborating with Renzo when, when they're in my group and uh, basically just showing the uh, resting state, spontaneous resting state profile of Vaso. Uh, and it's sort of like a, an enticing sort of uh, slide in the sense that and like a lot of the data that I'll show you with layer fMRI whole brain, oh, what's that? Oh, oh, there we go. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, like a lot of data that I that I showed you that I'll show you whole brain, it's it's not hasn't really been analyzed that deeply because uh, there's so much there's so much data. Uh, so this is just an example of looking at layer profiles across various segments of the brain and showing. Um, you know, there's a difference. There's clearly a higher power in uh, in the upper upper layers for some areas, higher power for in sort of uh, upper and lower, and then some higher power for the lower. And um, and I'm not going to try to make a story of that, but other than to show you that you know it's very clear data and it's it's there to be analyzed and modeled and explored. Um, so the data are are high quality if if you average enough and and 
kind of address the data carefully enough. So, um, and also that's combined with, uh, that's looking at histology data as well, um, uh, histological sort of T1 uh, weighted data to show the differences in, in the validation or the, or the actually the histological differences. So here's another intriguing uh, whole brain result. This is um, still being worked on. This is uh, unpublished, but I'll, I'll show it to you anyway. Uh, uh, some work by Yuhui Chai who had just recently left my group. And, and once again, he, he has a, this technique called uh, vapor, which is looking at whole brain. And, and this is where I think it's important. Uh, he actually shows really intriguing sort of uh, differences in, uh, he basically used a, a clustering technique to look at layer profiles. And he found that there was a grouping between uh, whether you're doing a task or not, uh, uh, between whether there's a predominant peak um, at, the, at the upper layers, uh, at the superficial layers versus in the middle. And there's much more to the paper than that. Um, but one thing actually that I think is interesting to bring out about this is not to overinterpret the data too much. It, I mean, it's clearly a difference. You clearly see uh, these differences in profiles. And also to try to use the fact that it creates a spatial pattern. Uh, and that could be an artificial spatial, pa spatial pattern, but there's a spatial pattern there that it corresponds to. And that's sort of an intriguing result that that whole brain data that give you maps give you. So people sometimes throw that out as not really an argument for uh, uh, the fidelity of the data, but it's actually it actually is compelling. And I think it's worth uh, looking into that more and using that, but without over interpreting it. I don't know even know how to interpret this exactly. So, um, all right. And this sort of addresses the problem that we that we have to that I think is is a is a really big one that we haven't yet fully gotten to, even though we've been sort of thinking about it for a long time. I guess whole brain layer fMRI hasn't been around long enough to really have people grapple with this problem. And that is, you know, certainly when you do, uh, you know, standard segmentation, if you're looking at resting state or even a task, uh, you have this connectivity matrix, you can parcelate the brain and look at that that way. That's one way of looking at the data. And then of course, if you then have layer fMRI, you could, uh, you know, uh, defi decide on your, your networks and then, uh, and then look at the, um, the layer dependence within and across networks. And that sort of explodes out the, 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 uh, the dimension and the dimensions in which you're looking at your data. And if you really want to do this completely, it would just be, you know, not able to be handled. I mean, it's sort of an, an added dimension looking at layer and, uh, you know, on a voxel wise basis, potentially, or a column wise basis. It's, it's a lot of data and it's a lot to make sense of. So we're at this stage now where we have a ton of data and it's barely at the limits of our computational abilities to make sense of it. So we have to, we're forced to go into the neuroscience and form clear hypothesis to take these stabs at the data. I mean, it's, it's really important. You can't just take the data and, and sort of, you know, let the patterns fall out. That would be, that's, maybe we could try that, but I think it would be much, make much more progress if we iterate with what's known, you know, from the neuroscience literature to try to, you know, make very selective hypotheses. All right. And this is just another example of, uh, it's not totally related, but it's sort of related in the sense that uh, uh, this is a comparison I, uh, of different parcellation methods. And the only point, the point I want to make about this uh, work, nice work by Evan Gordon, comparing different parcellation methods. And the, what I want to say about this is that, uh, uh, that any, no matter what method you're looking at, there's a lot of heterogeneity of the signal within each parcel. Uh, and so, once again, you can divide it, you can divide the brain down to columns, and there's probably unique information in each column. So I think it's, that's kind of, to me, what this, what this shows. I mean, if you look at this plot of homogeneity versus parcel size, it goes down to each, each voxel. And there's probably heterogeneity of neural activity within a voxel. But, uh, the, the message from this is let's go to as high resolution as possible uh, and smooth as little as possible to, to look and to find clever ways of looking at each voxel uh, because there's, there's truly information there that, that could really uh, advance the impact of layer fMRI in that regard. And this is just one example that was also shown yesterday, but I, I, I'm always intrigued by this. And it's a very simple technique. It's, it's just iterative ICA, basically, uh, calculating ICA 
on the data. And typically people do, you know, when they do ICA, they say, oh, there's these networks. And then they stop there. Uh, and they say, that's great. There's, and that we really like this network and we're gonna talk about it. But, but then if you could, I mean, that's what not all people do, but sometimes it's, it's the tendency to do that, to stop. And if you could actually, you could take that network and then do ICA within that network, sort of a poor man's, there's other pet techniques that are more efficient. Um, and you go into that network and you, uh, uh, you actually then do ICA of that. And then you keep on breaking it down, doing ICA of this network and then doing an ICA of maybe this network that you like and, and so on. And if you have enough sensitivity, if you have enough signal to noise, you finally get ICA components that sort of organize themselves around uh, digits of the finger. And so that's indicating that you wouldn't necessarily see that if but you did the first ICA and then tried to look at your you know, nth component, uh, it would be completely mixed with the noise. But if you actually picked your components that made sense, uh, it, obviously there's some subjectivity on this, uh, then you could sort of get this structure. So there's a certain art to this, this analysis as well of that's sort of based on knowledge of like the fact that the, the you know, hand, the motor cortex has digit representation. Okay, uh, so what are the possible avenues of, of impact? Uh, so I, the way I break this down is that, okay, so certainly we want to determine human layer fMRI signatures, corresponding results of invasive studies. And this is an important point. I, I, I wanna emphasize signatures because it's never gonna be a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, it's never gonna be like, you're not gonna find the fMRI response that is neural activity. It's gonna be some signature that's bubbling up through neural activity, through the hemodynamics, through the noise, that's going to show something that we hope maps, uh, either spatially or in, in information space. Uh, uh, also determine wider cortical and subcortical connectivity from human layer FM results that were uh, that are motivated by invasive studies. So, so you know, certainly use these studies to uh, to motivate this. Uh, but then also, and this is also important, to repeat the most uh, compelling human fMRI studies at layer resolution. There's a lot of really amazing, purely human fMRI studies that would that really, if they were redone at, at layer resolution, would would be uh, uh, very compelling, I think. And and I'll just give you a couple of examples of all of this, or one example. So this is some work. As I was doing research for this talk, I uh, I realized that there was actually a lot of work on uh, looking at uh, uh, excitatory neurons and interneurons or inhibitory neurons uh, in the layers. And so so you have you know, very specific layers that are predominantly excitatory neurons. And you have, you know, specific layers that are inhibitory. You could potentially, you know, take this information and, and try to uh, determine if, if you have a, you know, a, a stimulus, if this, you know, if how this corresponds and if you can actually map these two independently to some degree. And there's other work, uh, uh, both uh, by um, Sanji Kim's group and this, uh, this other group with, with recent papers uh, showing, uh, you know, if you have a, a GABA agonist that actually uh, increases the inhibition uh, 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 right here. And if these two things happen, one, the amplitude of the steady state goes down, <coughs> or three things happen. The amplitude of the steady state goes down, the transient is higher amplitude, the post undershoot is a little bit longer or a little bit more pronounced. So. Doing this at a layer level, you might be able to see this additional, you know, modulation of one specific layer or, or the other uh, uh, with at various stages of this. Uh, really nice work by, by Sanji Kim's group actually showing uh, using optogenetics selective excitation of uh, uh, excitatory and inhibitory neurons, showing uh, exactly what Amir Shmuel actually said in his comments to my question. Uh, that basically what happens if you're exciting both, as typically happens, you have inhibitory activity that then uh, is overwhelmed by the excitatory activity and it reaches a steady state. But I think that there's information about teasing out the inhib inhibition versus excitation from your layer fMRI data by looking at these dynamics and, and maybe the spatial location. So, so that sort of seems like it's, it's able to be pulled out. Uh, there's also uh, really nice work uh, by, uh, to me, a classic paper by Carl Zillis' group uh, looking at receptor densities, among other things. But this is just mapping the, the heterogeneity of various receptors across layers. You know, this goes left to right from uh, upper to lower. And uh, what, like I said, I'm not going to go into detail, but that could actually motivate a lot of our studies as well. If we're looking at 
if we're trying to modulate a receptor and we see a specific layer activity uh, that might show its efficacy or not. And um, uh, along the lines of work that's motivated by uh, really cool fMRI work that already exists. And so this is one of the coolest papers I've seen in recent years. Uh, one of them, uh, at least the top 10, is uh, Alex Huth actually showing these semantic maps uh, using voxel-wise modeling. And basically showing that uh, when a person is listening to a naturalistic stimuli, uh, you can map out uh, throughout large swaths of the cortex, uh, their semantic activity. And, uh, you know, basically, and you can divide into subcategories of social or objects or whatever. So there's this detail there. And so you can imagine redoing this with enough averaging at, at very, very high resolution and uh, looking at layer activity that, and which you can start to ask the question, you know, are these, are these areas that had these individual voxels that have like chair information, uh, you know, does that have, is there some sort of, you know, corresponding chair information everywhere else? Is it going into layer four? Is it, is there somehow being coordinated in a subcortical way? Is it, you know, it's important to actually also with layers to tie into looking at uh, subcortical structures uh, as a modulator of, of coordinated cortical activity. Uh, so much that we can do with, with whole brain fMRI really should. I think that that's, that's the other side of the story is the subcortical activity, uh, it, it, this communication. So anyway, so that's just another example that I would love to have done, uh, redone with, with layer fMRI. Um, uh, and this is sort of to emphasize my point that I was just making, that this is one, uh, not really a laminar study, but it's uh, high resolution in which they were uh, looking at uh, subcortical cortical sort of connectivity. Uh, there's much more that could be done with that in terms of task modulation and whatnot. So that was actually compelling and motivating. And this is a data set uh, that I always like to show. It's uh, uh, Javier Gonzalez Castillo actually would torture these subjects, uh, not really torture, but um, put them in the scanner and have them look at a very simple stimulus and, uh, and, and tap their fingers when they, when they just recognize an aspect of the stimulus, a very simple motor task. But basically it was for nine hours. And the thought is, why would you do it for nine hours? It's one subject, so it's all self-registered. And what he found uh, was something that I think is, is, I always like to emphasize, is that there's so much more going on. And what he found is that uh, when, he, when he freed up the exploration of the data from just simple, simple canonical models of the hemodynamic response uh, to anything that was time-locked to the stimulus, uh, he found that, uh, and also using, using just basically k-means uh, uh, k clustering to, to pull out the information, he found that there's a very clear spatial organization uh, corresponding to responses that don't really even look like, uh, you know, what your canonical hemodynamic response is. Uh, I think there's more information that could be tapped from this data. Uh, basically, the brain is active everywhere, even when you're doing a simple task in some way that's time-locked, but not intuitive how the, the hemodynamic response looks. So it would be interesting to, uh, I would love to have a data set of, uh, you know, averaging a subject. You probably have to average them for like 20 hours or 30 hours with layer fMRI to get uh, comparable signal to noise, but having a super high sensitive layer fMRI data. So you, you have no doubt that of the fidelity of the signal and the signal to noise that you can actually explore. Um, and also of course, uh, complementary to amazing uh, uh, diffusion tensor based tractography work. I mean, you, you're start to, starting to get diffusion imaging data that, uh, you know, looking at U fibers and whatnot, looking at, you know, exactly where they terminate and what layer of the cortex. You could start to, uh, in a synergistic way, look at, at these track tracings and see if they predict or motivate, you know, uh, hypotheses of, of what the layer activity should be. So using that as well. Okay, so then, um, so as far as what's needed, uh, so I think that we're at the stage right now where we need uh, we need standards uh, in acquisition and processing. We don't need standards that will lock the field, but we need something we can all agree upon that we, that are tools that are available. Uh, we need we need standards in interpretation. Uh, I think that uh, along the lines of the discussion yesterday about um, you know what kind of papers you should uh, submit. I think that I, I think that it 
the field should have an agreement of, of what's an over interpretation and uh, you know how you can actually interpret your data based on your pulse sequence used and your and your calibration method. We need validation. I mean, I think that the most important papers right now and the most impactful will be the ones that uh, uh, either are combined with electrophysiology or use electrophysiologic information uh, to motivate the experiment or really, really well-crafted neuroscience experiments that show something insightful as it's a, a proof of concept in itself. Those are the most important ones. There's, there's nothing more important we can do right now. Um, I, I actually think that, uh, that with fMRI, for instance, even with fMRI back in 91, it, it just worked. It was a lot easier than this, and it just worked. It was hard to not get results, but it really struggled uh, for about, you know, it's still struggling. <laughs> um, that, you know, there people are saying, oh, well, how do you believe this data in this way? Um, and so it's, uh, I think that, you know, with Logothetis, that helped the field. That paper was hugely cited. There's other papers along the line. Uh, so finally, it's catching on. But I think that the validation papers are the most important for, for catalyzing the field. Uh, we need more neuroscientists using uh, layer of my, because here the questions are even more nuanced, I think. Um, like in the early days of fMRI, you had a physicist go in there and say, OK, tap your fingers. I think I'll, I'll look this up. And here's the motor cortex, and it works. Um, whereas the questions that you ask with layer fMRI, I think uh, you, you, it, it, it emphasizes the importance of having collaborations with neuroscientists um, who have a who are you know a much wider background in the field to ask these questions that could leverage the, the technique. And we're we're really close. I think we need, you know, <laughs> and I and I and I, I I think that obviously with everything you always want more, but um, I I sense that we're sort of at this strange threshold where we need just a little bit more. I mean, we're at the, I'm not really worried about the resolution or the speed that much, but we need sensitivity uh, and a little bit more specificity. And, and then I think we'll be good. But, uh, <laughs> but I think we're really close. I just, we just need a little bit more because there's a lot of times where, I mean, you have to do, you know, it's a difference between doing, needing 20 hours of averaging versus one hour. It's a very nonlinear sort of function. Uh, being at that threshold of what sensitivity is. And I think we're just there. Um, uh, I'm not really going to focus too much on this because, you know, we, it's, this has pretty much been drilled in. This, but this is a nice paper uh, uh, talking about the sort of systematizing uh, the idea of doing cross-modality, uh, cross cross uh, cross-species, and then... Um, cross species, cross modality sort of comparison. So you can actually tighten up all these connections. Uh, and the key issue, the key point is looking at neural signatures across different recording modalities. So it's not to map the one-to-one, -one. you just look for the neural signatures that seem to correspond. Uh, yeah, outstanding paper. And this paper was just discussed. I was using this as one of my examples of uh, uh, an outstanding paper that, uh, that has a well-crafted method and also a well-crafted question Along with the method that uh, uh, that is um, uh, novel, but but also very careful and rigorous, and, and it's you know this this these sort of papers actually give the the entire field traction in terms of uh, their impact, its impact, because it's believable, the methods are sound, and uh, and and right away you think of new things you can do with this. So, um, okay, this is sort of my my wish list of the future. Uh, and I think we're close in some things. I'm not really, so 0.1 millimeter voxel size, we're kind of close. We're not like an order of magnitude away. Uh, two second TR, we're already there for gradient echo for the most part, uh, close. Uh, it would be nice to do this for, uh, for vaso uh, or other blood volume. And, but here's another question with, with vaso. It's like, we, we know that it does seem like blood volume changes are more sense, more localized in neural activity. Uh, we don't really know that for sure. I mean, it's sort of empirical that that uh, it, it is, it looks like it is. Um, and, it, and it sort of makes sense, right? Oxygenation would have downstream draining effects, whereas the blood volume just changes and it goes back down. But um, it would be nice to further establish that. Uh, uh, I would say that a, a 40 to 1 Temporal signal to noise would be would be desirable. It's well below that for most cases, but I think that would actually allow us to do a much wider range of experiments. But we can't just get it. I mean, obviously, uh, there's strategies, and we're 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 struggling for every last bit we, we can. I do think that 
even though physiologic noise and, and pulsations are a problem, I think we're well into the thermal noise regime when we're really, really pushing the techniques. So techniques such as Nordic uh, that get rid of thermal noise would uh, uh, benefit us a lot. And we really do need a seamless pipeline uh, from raw data to layer segmented data. I've, you know, many people in my group and many people that I've talked to struggle with this. They, they, they're, they're using tools that are all over the place that are they're either homegrown or whatever. I think we do need something at least in the context similar to with standard fMRI, um, you know, that, that has a seamless sort of uh, continuation uh, that would help the field as well. And uh, we just need more convincing demonstrations of, of functional modulation across several layers with several tasks, just something simple. Like, you know, in the early days of fMRI, it was, you know, left and right finger tapping or or array of tasks, you see the active, activation, it seems to make sense. Well, here we need, uh, you know, we need to be able to find something that may not be profound from a neuroscience standpoint, but that clearly modulates layers and then show that like really clearly. And that that goes a long way in getting, giving attraction among other neuroscientists. So, um, and so I think these are the most important, I think, uh, capillary specificity and signal to noise. Uh, I'm not going to go into calibration, a lot of calibration methods out there. I worry that about the, uh, the, the, how much uh, sensitivity you give up with calibration. Other nice uh, uh, calibration methods that, you know, I, I just saw this one looking at uh, uh, resting state fluctuations uh, across layers as a way of, of calibrating the signal. But, and then I looked at that and I thought, well, this is, this is great. It actually, you calibrate based on the magnitude, and this is an important point, you calibrate based on the magnitude of the bold response uh, and uh, with resting state. And if you do that, so basically the idea that the larger amplitude fluctuations in the layers uh, are larger vessels or downstream vessels if you do uh, deconvolution. And if you do that, if you normalize to that, you get back uh, something that looks like uh, something that's produced with vapor. Uh, but it also tells you that if you're trying to look at resting state connectivity across layers, uh, with bold that you have to be very careful because it might be driven very much by the by this uh, large vessel effect. Okay, uh, the last thing, last two slides is this part of the talk is quick. Uh, so what's uncertain? Um, I'm not, I don't know, uh, I'm hopeful, but I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to uh, increase our sensitivity. There'll be probably better ways of doing that, uh, especially in the context of physiologic noise. Um, Thermal noise, you know, better coils, closer coils, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, cl more clever ways of averaging, reducing partial volume averaging as well. Uh, will we be able to remove all the vascular bias uh, while maintaining sufficient sensitivity? I have no doubt we're probably going to be able to remove the vascular bias, but uh, the real question is all the sensitivity that we lose if we remove it, is it, is it worth it? And for instance, in fMRI, in standard fMRI, it, it generally is not worth it. Um, nobody really calibrates. Uh, they all use standard bold. They don't, uh, uh, because they know that that little bit of sensitivity allows them to ask much better questions in a more, in a, in a shorter time. Uh, at the expense of some interpretation, but not that much. And so I think it makes more of a difference with layer fMRI. Uh, so I think it's important to, uh, uh, that's an open question that I don't know. Uh, recurrent connections. I'm a little bit less worried about this now, even after this workshop. So I learned something where uh, that uh, it seems that, and, and I don't know why, but it seems that with, uh, with layer fMRI that it's only the inputs uh, that uh, cause bold activation. So not, it's not the, the output, it's more the input. Um, and, and so if that's the case, that simplifies the problem a little bit more. Oh, there we go, back again. <laughs> um, and so if that's the case, that actually does sort of simplify the problem a little bit more. And, and so that would be wonderful to actually further verify. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, so we need to not only, uh, you know, uh, so we need to over, we just resist over-interpretation of the data. So if we over-interpret our data, uh, eventually we'll, you know, get out in the field and they'll, it, will, it will actually slow down our progress. I think we all need to be very careful um, in, in building a model, fitting it to a model, but not really saying this is, you know, we're absolutely certain about. There's so many uncertainties in this. And so there's an example of recurring connections. 
that looks really intimidating, but it's actually, uh, it's actually, uh, I think that we can build models like this with layer of Mirai. So finally, so what's hopeful? So the one, the thing I've seen from the field with what working with, with Renzo and everyone else is that uh, there's so much room for improvement in uh, uh, experimental design. Right now, our experiments are kind of crude, and so they're, you know, if we have a crude experiment, we, we might get something like a salt and pepper pattern of, about things, and, and it, it's hard to interpret. I think that with better experimental design, better processing methods, I think that will, will make a lot of progress. Um, uh, and I've also seen, it's really hopeful that I've seen papers that have jumped out at me and saying, this, this is real. I, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure of it. And not that my opinion matters, but it's sort of, uh, I do think that there's certain papers that uh, really give me hope that, uh, that what we're seeing is a real neural effect and that it has real leverage in terms of answering fundamental questions about connectivity of layer activity across the brain. And uh, uh, I think that, um, you know, while layer fMRI may not be ever be as uh, precise or as quantitative as invasive methods, the key word here is neural signatures. I think that the signatures that it provide um, will carry meaningful information uh, that exists, and it's that it's decodable, as as was shown in just the last talk. I think that, and that's kind of a key point. I think one of the points brought out in the last talk uh, that Nico Krogis, Craig Astori was talking about, how you have this distorted image. You know, we might have our layer activation might always be a little distorted, but if we find methods for then, uh, you know, uh, uh, filtering out that uh, distortion to actually get the information uh, and to use the information that it provides, uh, that's really all that really matters as far as that's concerned. Uh, so maybe we don't need to dwell as much on the hemodynamic aspect and exactly where the layer it is. That's important information, but there's there's also it's decodable and there are signatures that are related to underlying neural activity that we can pull out. Um, and also, yeah, okay, so then MR technology continues to prove. I actually have no, this is the part I'm most confident about. I think that we're in this phase of MR technology improvement that I think it will continue, this will continue, I think, to improve for, for quite some time, uh, driven by even other factors than just layer fMRI uh, that, that will be continuously surprised as far as that's concerned. Okay, all right, so that's why I'm overall hopeful and I think that's a, it's a really, really exciting, it's actually probably the most exciting time to be in fMRI in general because we're starting to get traction and we're starting to actually make connections between the neuroscience and, and the fMRI signal. And we have really good techniques, uh, processing techniques as well and acquisition. Uh, so it's, there's more, there's this parameter space that there's not enough people to fill it right now and, and it's a great time to be working on it. All right, and now with that, I'd like to thank all the members of my group, and in particular, Yuhui Chai uh, for providing um, uh, his, his data, and also, of course, Renzo, who, who, without Renzo doing any of this, you know, I wouldn't be up here talking, <laughs> and we wouldn't be having this meeting, I think. Um, anyway, all right, well, thank you.